Hi there, and thanks for joining NSBA for today's webinar on the independent contractor rules. My name is Molly Day, and I'm the VP of Public Affairs here at NSBA. Um, a couple of ground rules before we get started. Uh, we are expecting quite a few people on the line, uh, so we are going to have all lines muted. If you have any questions, please put those in the chat. Um, and regarding the chat, if you can keep it relatively clear so we can focus in on those questions, we would greatly appreciate it. We will be recording the session and providing it on our social platforms as well as on our website. Um, so just a heads up to everybody there. Um, with that, I'd like to, to dig in. We're gonna try and uh, be done with this um, at 45 minutes at the latest. And if we can give you back an extra 15 minutes, then we'll certainly try and do that. Um, we've got some great speakers today and I'm, I'm really pleased to, to introduce those to you. Uh, the first person we're going to be hearing from is uh, Reed Westcott, and, and a lot of you have probably already um, chatted with Reed. He's the Director of Federal Policy here at NSBA. He's been with us about a year, and he's making great strides in, in building relationships and solidifying NSBA as the go-to voice of small business on Capitol Hill. Um, he's going to be talking about the new rule, how it came to fruition, and uh, NSBA's involvement along the way. Um, then you're going to hear from um, one of our great friends, Bob Shea, um, and, and he's going to really break down what the rule means for you, what the changes are from how it previously operated. Um, and, and Bob is a partner at Beck Reed right in, in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, he's got more than 30 years of experience advising employers and entrepreneurs in labor and employment law. Um, he specializes in wage hour, pay equity, traditional labor, um, harassment, and dis uh, discrimination issues. Um, he's got expertise in drafting employment agreements, non-compete, non-solicitation, non-disclosure, um, independent contractor agreements, and separation agreements. So um, there really is, is nobody better suited to talk to you all about this situation than, than Bob is. Um, and what's nice for us is that Bob has been on our board for well over a decade and is, has just been a tremendous help as we've tried to navigate some of the, the COVID um, labor issues and, and many other labor issues that continue coming up for small businesses, um, uh, you know, time and again. So with that, um, I'm going to just double check and see if Reed is is joining us yet. Um, I know he had a meeting across town and I'm not sure if he's back to the office. So um, not seeing him here. Ian, do you see Reed with us yet? Not just yet, but we'll okay. we'll have him here shortly, I believe. Okay. So I, I think with that, what I'd like to do is is kick it over to you, Molly, Bob. I'm so wanna... sorry to interrupt. We okay. we have Reed joining now. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Appreciate everybody's patience. Um, we're going to give Reed just a quick minute to get um, get his audio connected, and then we'll kick it over to Reed to do the um, background of the rule and talk about some of the other um, key things that NSBA has been working on uh, with regards to the independent contractor rule. So, with that, Reed, we'll we'll kick it over to you. Maybe. Oh, sorry, having, having a little bit of a, an audio issue here. So thank you so much, Molly. Really, really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for taking the time to, to be with us today. I apologize for the lack of video. I'm actually uh, en route from uh, some meetings with key stakeholders uh, here in D.C. at the moment. So uh, please bear with me. Apologies for that again. Um, happy to give you guys a little bit of an overview of uh, kind of what we've been doing on uh, the independent contractor rule and, and kind of the state of play for us. Um, so a little bit of background here. Um, on October 11, 2022, uh, DOL issued a new proposed rule uh, that would uh, help determine whether or not a worker is an employee or a contractor that was uh, largely a rollback of a similar rulemaking that occurred during the Trump administration. Um, when determining a worker status, the Biden administration will use a multi-factor economic realities test that considers factors of the working relationship to determine whether the worker is truly in business for themselves um, or not. Uh, the proposed changes would be a return to a totality of the circumstances analysis, um, which evaluates all factors involved in the working relationship equally as opposed to weighting one higher than another. Um, so it also rescinds a Trump era rule that outlines a similar multi-factor test, but that gives greater weight to how much control workers have over job duties and opportunities for profit and loss when determining whether or not they're classified as an uh, employee or independent contractor. Um, so DOL officials have said that the uh, simplified Trump rule is kind of inconsistent with uh, previous federal court decisions and would result in more workers being misclassified as independent contractors when they should be uh, actually classified as employees. Um, so the, the Trump test uh, was five factors, but two were given uh, weight, as I mentioned before, they weren't all considered equally. Uh, the two with the greater weight were the nature and degree of the worker's control over the work and the worker's opportunity for profit and loss based on personal initiative or investment. Um, so the new proposal uh, considers those and four others, which are uh, investments by the worker and the employer, the degree of permanence of the working relationship, the extent to which the work performed is an integral part of the employer's business, and the degree of skill and initiative exhibited by the worker. Um, DOL can also consider what they call additional factors beyond those. So they kind of gave themselves a little bit of a blank check to kind of consider uh, non-standard uh, uh, issues kind of beyond the, the scope there to make sure that they're kind of getting a better picture of that. Um, but we think that might be a little bit overbroad. 
Um, so the, the rule also provides additional analysis of the control factor, including how scheduling, supervision, price setting, the ability to work for others should be considered when analyzing the degree of control over a worker. Um, DOL wasn't definitive on the, the impact because it doesn't have data on the number of misclassified workers and because there are inherent challenges in determining the extent to which the rule would reduce this misclassification. Um, but the, uh, they were still able to uh, estimate uh, a cost for uh, affected companies, independent contractors, and local governments, which they calculated out to be $188.3 million. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the procedural history of this and a little bit of information on, on the background there. And with that, I'm happy to pass it back to Molly. Thanks for that, Reed. I um, appreciate you uh, dialing in. I know it's it's tricky getting <laughs> getting across town, and um, we had to um, move your schedule around a bit. So I really appreciate that insight, um, Bob. Why don't we turn it over to you, and you can really dig into the rule and let us know what it means. Yeah, right. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Molly, and thank thank you, Reed. Uh, there's a lot as you may have already gathered from listening to to Reed. There's uh, a lot of uh, lot to cover in a relatively short time, uh, some technical terms. What I put in the uh, the meeting chat uh, are a few links, to, I think very helpful links that the Department of Labor has uh, has issued. Uh, one is a fact sheet concerning the rule. Uh, another is a uh, uh, FAQs on the rule and uh, also a small business, a small entity compliance guide. And you may want to uh, save those links and uh, refer to them later on because it, it covers what we're going to be covering in a lot more detail. And uh, there's an additional document that I put in the chat box that I'll refer to later, but it uh, it deals, it's a pre-rule uh, document, but it, it addresses some things that I'll be mentioning in a couple minutes. Uh, but let me put this in context. Uh, the issue of independent contractor misclassification is uh, you know it's just not a it's not just a Department of Labor issue. Uh, it's actually uh, Department of Labor and this rule covers one particular statute, a very important statute, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which uh, guarantees minimum wage for all workers uh, for all hours worked and overtime pay for hours worked uh, over forty hours per week for all covered non-exempt employees. So it's a significant. Uh, law in the United States. It was also uh, enacted back in 1935 when the workplace was a whole lot different. And uh, this issue of misclassification, uh, independent contract misclassification, has become a bigger and bigger issue in recent years with the gig economy and with just a lot of businesses utilizing uh, independent contractors and a lot of individuals uh, acting as independent contractors rather than employees and preferring to do so. So this this law that was uh, enacted uh, almost a, uh, a century ago is still the law in the books. And uh, uh, some of the rules, including the six factor test we'll be talking about, uh, became the rules actually back in 1947 as a result of uh, a couple of the Supreme Court decisions. And as some of the recent developments in the economy have caused more and more confusion for businesses as to what's proper classification uh, between employee and independent contractor. The uh, Trump administration, the Trump Department of Labor, for the first time promulgated a rule which tried to provide some further guidance rather than the six factors. As Reed said, it tried to focus on two predominant factors that employers can look at in deciding whether or not someone should be classified or could be classified as an independent contractor versus an employee. And um, that was the first time there was actually a rule that that uh, that addressed that. The statute itself doesn't, in fact, talk about independent contractor versus employee. So it's been a result of these core decisions and then more recently these uh, the, the rule under the Trump administration and then the more recent rule under the Biden administration. Uh, again, a little bit more context. So we talk about the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the main federal law dealing with minimum wage and overtime. There's also the National Labor Relations Act. There's uh, the Internal Revenue Code. And some folks might be familiar with the IRS applying a 20 factor test or common law test in determining whether or not someone's an independent contractor or an employee. There's a variety of state laws uh, in each state, as a matter of fact, but it's certainly 50 laws that deal with uh, independent contractor 
classification for purposes of wage, state wage and hour laws, uh, for workers' comp laws, for unemployment compensation laws, for uh, state uh, income tax laws. And some of those uh, law, some of those tests that those other agencies apply, particularly at the state level, uh, are different than the the rule that we're going to be talking about, but uh, also could be more more strict. And those of you who do business in one of those states, like California or Massachusetts or uh, and a variety of others, uh, may be familiar with the strict tests that those states now apply. A strict uh, three part test that uh, is much more difficult for businesses to uh, to comply with if they want to treat someone as an independent contractor. So while the FLSA is important, uh, all businesses need to be aware that there are other uh, other tests that may be applied, particularly if you're one of those states that apply this strict test, sometimes referred to as the ABC test. Uh, back to the FLSA. Uh, so uh, the, as Reed said, the Trump administration uh, tried to simplify the the, the test that uh, the government, that the Department of Labor and courts would apply in determining whether or not someone is class, properly classified as an independent contractor. Uh, opponents, employee advocacy groups, viewed that new that rule as more business friendly and less employee friendly and believed that it took the six factors and by by putting more weight on two particular factors and maybe downplaying weight given to some other factors uh, allowed businesses to more easily classify service providers, workers as independent contractors. And uh, when the Biden administration uh, get, took over, uh, they immediately seized upon that rule as something that was not employee friendly and sought to rescind the rule uh, that rendered some problems with the courts in rescinding the rule, and then they ultimately promulgated the role rule, which goes back to the uh, six-factor test. Uh, and those factors are uh, discussed in fair amount of detail in the uh, in the materials that I put in the in the group chat uh, include uh, opportunity for loss. So these are factors that now the Department of Labor looks at somewhat equally. And some factors may weigh in favor of employee status. Some factors may uh, in favor of uh, uh, of independent contractor status. And you know, unfortunately, for a lot of businesses, they're they're stuck looking at the factors and and trying to determine uh, which ways in uh, favor one way, which goes the other way, and which should be given in this particular situation more uh, more weight uh, because we're. With the, the, the Department of Labor under Trump administration said you can really put these two factors as predominant. Now we're back to the six factors, weighing those six factors. Uh, the, um, uh, the the goal of the six factor test of this rule is to decide if the worker is economically dependent on the employer for work or instead is in business for themselves. That's the main goal of the test and applying these factors. That's why it's called the economic realities test versus the common law uh, control test that other agencies uh, may apply. But it's looking at the economic realities of the situation. And the Department of Labor said, if you look at these fact, six factors, that we should give an employer a sense of whether or not this service provider, this worker is in fact uh, in, properly classified as an independent contractor. Opportunity for work uh, or uh, or law, uh, for profit or loss, depending upon managerial skill, that looks primarily at whether a worker can earn profits or suffer losses through their own independent effort or deci and decision making, uh, as opposed to someone who's just paid the same amount of of, of money, an hourly rate or or uh, a f other fixed fee, regardless of how they perform the job and their level of of expertise. Uh, relevant factors include whether the worker negotiates their pay, decides to accept or decline work, hires their own workers, purchases materials and equipment, or engages in other efforts to expand business or secure more, more work, such as marketing or advertising. And this factor, like the other factors, is sort of focused on, is this service provider really operating like their own business? Yeah. And in, in the way they obtain work and the way they negotiate how they're paid and the investment they put in their business. Um, 
which leads to the second factor, which is in fact investment by the worker uh, and you know and compared to the employee, is the worker in fact you know buying equipment, uh, uh, making capital and entrepreneurial uh, investments, uh, supporting the growth of the business, increasing the number of its clients, reducing costs, doing all the sorts of things that a a business versus an employee would do. Uh, third factor, the degree of permanence of the work relationship. So the Department of Labor looks at saying, is this someone who's going to be providing services on a ongoing, indefinite basis, similar to employee, an at-will employee? Uh, or is this more of a project-based uh, uh, piece of work? Um, and if it's more project-based, it's more similar to, to uh, you know someone that a, a business that you would hire to provide a certain task versus an employee that would be employed indefinitely. Uh, the nature and degree of control. So this the, the idea of how much the employer, the business is controlling how the work is performed is the same in all these tests. And it's just what, what it's just one of six factors in this uh, test that Department of Labor applies in, in under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, the extent to which the work performed is an integral part of the employer's business. I mean, how is this sort of a side? You know, is this a you're bringing someone in to lay carpet in your offices? Well, that's not an integral part of your business, and that may suggest that person is an independent contractor. But if the person is performing a duty for you, uh, sales duty or or manufacturing duty, which is an integral part of your business, that would weigh in favor of of uh, employee status uh, and skills and initiative. The factor looks primarily whether the worker uses their own specialized skills together with business planning and effort to perform the work and support uh, to grow a business. The fact that employ uh, a fact that a worker does not use specialized skills, uh, for example, the worker relies on um, the employer to provide training for the job indicates that the worker is an employee. So if the if the employee is investing in their own developing their own skills uh, to perform jobs for one employer or for multiple employers. That suggests uh, the person is properly classified as independent contractor. If the person is actually coming, is getting their training from you, the business, that would suggest employee status. So a real quick uh, uh, run through the, uh, the six factors. Um, what's the risks for employers and what employers, what can employers do to minimize the risk? Well, you have to know the law. You have to know the law of the state th that you're in beyond the the the, the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, and uh, th the safest route so sometimes, if you determine that these factors and other issues and other factors weigh in favor of employee status is to convert the employee, the, the worker to an employee. That's always the, <laughs> the safest bet in those situations, often not practical, but the safest bet. Another uh, approach would be to require that worker to treat themselves as an employee to form their own entity, an LLC, a own, own entity, and treat themselves as an employee. Because under all of these, these statutes, if the worker is being treated as an employee, even by themselves or by another business, you're engaging ABC LLC to perform services. And maybe one person providing those services, but that person is an employee of ABC LLC, there's really going to be no violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act or, or, or most of these other statutes. Uh, sometimes it's not practical to, to uh, because the, the the worker or the service provider is simply not going to be able to, uh, or at least not practical to treat themselves as an, empl as an employee. You want them, you know, they, get, they want to be paid as a 1099 um, independent contractor. And you're faced with a situation where there's risk. You're not sure how the Department of Labor or another agency or court might evaluate the situation. You can sometimes just accept the risk, but mitigate it by taking steps to make sure that uh, the the you're not running afoul of the Fair Labor Standards Act. The person is not working more than 40 hours a week, for example. You keep this so there's no overtime issue. Uh, typically, nowadays, most people are going to be paid at least $7.25 an hour. So usually they'll run into minimum wage issue. But the biggest risk is that you're paying someone, paying someone well, perhaps, $100 an hour, $150 an hour to provide a service, but you misclassify that worker, all right? And 
Uh, the person brings a claim when Department of Labor investigates and determines you misclassified the person. They're going to look and say, what was the person's hourly rate of pay? All right. It was $150 an hour. That person worked more than 20, more than 40 hours in a week. If the answer is yes. All right. Well, for every hour worked more than 20 hours, 40 hours a week, the person should have been paid overtime, time and a half. Instead of paying a uh, person $150 an hour, you should be paying them $225 an hour. Uh, and that could be a sizable risk, particularly if you're talking about more than one one worker. But even one worker could be a sizable risk. Uh, in addition, under some of these state laws, there are the availability of multiple damages. You misclassify someone, you know, you should have paid them X number of dollars in addition to what you paid them. Well, in a state like Massachusetts, you multiply that by three as damages, treble damages plus attorney's fees, which make sometimes even small dollar cases very attractive for uh, for employees to bring or be more attractive for lawyers representing employees to bring those claims because uh, small dollars can quickly turn into big dollars, particularly if it's uh, troubled, uh, particularly if you're talking about multiple employees. You treat 10 people the same way and it's determined that they were misclassified and you should have been paying them overtime. Or uh, you, you, should, you, sh you should not have been requiring that those workers pay for some of the costs of doing business as you frequently do with independent contractors. You're requiring that they... They, they bring their own, they purchase their own supplies and things like that. If the person is best classified, all those things can be part of a part of damages. And sometimes it could even spread to uh, um, employee benefits that they should have received if they had been properly classified as an employee. Uh, group health insurance premiums, uh, FICA, the employer share of FICA. So the, the exposure can be substantial and um, I guess the word to the wise, if your business is using someone as an independent contractor, treating someone as a 1099, even if they haven't, a, they've signed an independent contract agreement with states where they say, I understand that I'm, I am an independent contractor, I'm not an employee, uh, and I'm responsible for my insurance and other part, other aspects of my business. That is, is a good thing to have, uh, but not necessarily a shield. And the Department of Labor in this rule uh, and other agencies have said, we're going to look beyond that independent contractor uh, agreement. We're going to look at the real situation, the economic reality of the situation, determining whether or not the person was properly classified. Uh, so uh, if you are using independent contractors, that may very well be just fine, but you should really look at the situation, make sure, uh, look at the tests that will apply to the relationship and determine whether or not you're comfortable with continuing that that classification, uh, and perhaps you know take steps to mitigate your damages. So uh, that's a lot in a little bit of time. <laughs> uh, uh, Molly Reed, do you want to? Uh, <clears throat> have I have I missed some things? You know, I, I, I'll defer to you, Reed. I certainly don't think so. I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head there. Um, happy to happy to kind of pass it back, take any questions that folks have. If there's anything we can do to clarify, let us know. Yeah, and and please do put this in the chat. I do see one comment here that, um, that you know, in terms of it would be help. This is what the comment says: two things that would be helpful to clarify: um, minimum salary laws, um, gig economy, which is a new term, but it's it's basically the same. Um, and and this person is saying that they you know they've talked to journalists who have no idea what they're talking talking about and that they're the same thing so is there again i don't know that it's necessarily a question but is there you know any kind of effort to you know include gig workers and gig economy in these kind of regulations uh not in these regulations there are i mean in california uh you know there's been a, you know, more of an effort than in some states massachusetts there's been really no effort to um uh to create a a, a carve out for you know certain gig economy uh, industries. Um, so that's, you know, I, 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 I see that happening more as the reality of these, you know, misclassification, you know, is um, is hitting some of the, you know, the, the federal government or some of the state governments and they're seeing that this is a problem and that they're losing business. They're losing companies who are not doing business in their states because of the, uh, 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 you know, be, because of the the rules. Uh, so, uh, but I'm not. I don't. I haven't seen that anything about that in the rule dealing with the you know any kind of carve out for 
gig economy uh, businesses. Okay. Uh, we have two other uh, questions. Yeah, I, I see in the chat box that some people haven't seen the links and maybe because I did it before we went on, uh, they didn't show. I'm going to try to put them in right now. Because you know, I Bob, Ian, Ian did resend those out when you were talking, so okay. everybody should have access to them now. And if you just scroll all the way up to the top, um, for those of you who aren't seeing them, you will see them up at the top where Bob added them. And then again, where Ian did. Um, okay. there, there is a question here. Um, what about withholding taxes? Yep. Well, that that's 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 where you get to the, uh, you know, the 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 test that the IRS applies. So that, you know, the 20 factor or common law uh, right to control test. Uh, it, it, this is a real tangled web of laws for, you know, for employers, uh, you know, the, this, this rule doesn't really apply to it. The, uh, if you misclassified someone for purposes of the Fair Labor Standards Act and didn't pay them overtime and the Department of Labor went after you for that, it wouldn't necessarily implicate the, uh, your failure to make withholding deductions. The IRS might look at that, uh, and, uh, uh, but it's a, a, you know, it's a different test. I mean, I've had situations, believe me, in the last 20 years, in, being in Massachusetts and dealing with uh, an ABC test that was incorporated into Massachusetts wage and hour law. Uh, I've been counseling businesses for 20 years on these issues. Uh, and it's, uh, it's sometimes like putting your finger in a, you know, in, in a, in a dike because you're, you know, you're, Focusing on one issue, but then another issue might arise. The biggest issues I've seen for clients has been the wage and hour laws, uh, partly because that's where you know the money is for plaintiff's lawyers. Uh, you know, a plaintiff's lawyer is not going to uh, usually bring a claim saying you didn't make withholding deductions for my client's pay, uh, but they may say uh, you you didn't pay my uh, client for uh, when for overtime when he or she worked more than uh, 40 hours a, a week, or you or you required that my client cover some of the costs of doing business, uh, which you weren't permitted to do if you had properly classified my client as an employee. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, but not withholding uh, taxes is certainly an issue for misclassification. It's more of an IR, you know, an issue that gets you in trouble with the IRS or the or the state taxing authority. One other thing, um, the document that I attached is uh, I attached it more for the 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 appendix that it has on the various state laws. So it's as a good summary of all the state laws, the ABC test that I referred to. Um, so if you're you you know, if you're in whatever state you're in, uh, Oklahoma, for example, uh, you look to see whether or not there's a state uh, ABC test that applies to uh, workers in, in Oklahoma. Okay. Thanks, Bob. The next question we have is, um, uh, can you speak to how this impacts international subcontractors where the work is taking place outside of the country? Uh, well, it depends a little bit on the on the 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 statute. Uh, so, I'll give an example. You know, if you're a, a business in California and you're using a, and you're employing someone or employing, you're receiving services from someone who's uh, uh, based in. Uh, South Korea, uh, some states, uh, including California, including Massachusetts, take a fairly broad view of the application, the extraterritorial application of their laws, and will look at the situation and say, this: the person providing the services may have been outside the country, or outside of California, but maybe outside the country, but uh, they're reporting in to a business located in California, for example. And uh, and they have enough of a connection, uh, a nexus with California where uh, the employee is able to argue or California would be able to argue that the person has the, is, is given the protections of the California law. Um, as far as the FLSA is concerned, um, 
I don't think the rule addresses the extraterritorial uh, application of the statute, meaning does the law uh, ex provide protections to people who are not U.S. citizens, who are not providing service, who are well beyond that, broader than that, who are not just not U.S. Citizen, citizens, but are, are performing work outside of the U.S. Um, uh, I think it's on the misclassification issue, it really comes down to a question of the, the statute uh, that you're analyzing for purposes of not whether someone's in, uh, properly classified, whether it's the, you know, the Internal Revenue Code or the Fair Labor Standards Act, which, again, is the federal uh, minimum wage and overtime law or uh, uh, or a particular state law. It'd be a question of how uh, has that law been applied to workers who are providing services outside of the U.S.? If it has, then then the misclassification rule would you know, would apply equally because all these, 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 these tests of, of miss of independent contractor versus employee classification, the, the test is really, does this worker have the protections of this particular statute? Uh, and, uh, you know, is the person a considered to be an employee and have the protections of this particular statute? And, uh, uh, you know, so you look to this particular statute to say, has it been applied to someone who is providing services outside of the country or outside of the state? Okay, thanks, Bob. We have another question from my good friend Bill Lindsay. Um, says these these are regulations, not legislation. Is there any hope that Congress might intervene and create a law regarding this whole horrible regulation? Um, and, and I'll add something onto that too. Is there any kind of litigation regarding this? Um, Reed, is that something you want to address? Yes, happy to speak to that. So uh, that, that's it's a great uh, great thing to mention. So there are currently at least four lawsuits ongoing uh, about the uh, the legality of this of this regulation. So uh, we're watching those closely. I know a number of folks who we work with frequently in DC, including the U.S. Chamber and others, have joined on to some of these. Uh, to give you one brief moment, I'll be able to give you a quick rundown of what exactly those look like. Uh, the first one is uh, a Coalition for Workforce Innovation versus Sue, and we'll I'll, I'll make sure I include this information in the chat as well for folks. Um, the uh, second one uh, is uh, um, uh, Warren versus the United States Department of Labor. Um, that was a group of freelance writers who are uh, contending that the rule forces them into unwanted employment relationships. Third one is uh, Fritter's Transportation uh, versus the United States Department of Labor. Uh, so that one is uh, an independent trucking uh, business owner that relies on contracting labor. Um, and so each each one of those is kind of targeted at uh, making sure that uh, the, the regulation ends up being nullified. So that's what we're looking at on that front. Um, I also know that uh, both the House and Senate uh, committees with jurisdiction over labor issues are working actively to try to see what they can get across the line in terms of uh, Congressional Review Act action on, on a number of issues. Um, I think this is one where uh, we are unlikely to have uh, a, a great amount of success. You may have seen that there was a recent passage of, uh, of a CRA action on this. Uh, here, I'll just pull up the exact vote count for you if you give me just one quick moment. Uh, yeah, so uh, introduced by uh, Senator Cassidy, there was uh, a uh, a CRA action uh, to um, make uh, major modifications to uh, to that and repeal that uh, that implementation. Um, I do not have the final action report in front of me. I'm very very sorry, but I know that uh, both committees are are actively working on that, along with a host of other issues, including joint employer uh, regulation um, and overtime rules. So they're they're looking at all of that very closely, and if there is a path forward to get that done, this seems to be the Congress that's going to be willing to do it. Um, there's been a lot of uh, interesting bipartisanship on on uh, revocate, revocation of labor issues. Uh, we've got some interesting crossover from from some Democrats. Um, I know the administration is going to push back very fiercely on anything that comes in terms of Congressional Review Act action because they want to make sure that they're preserving the the work that they're doing. Um, but I think Congress is is stepping up and and trying to make sure that folks recognize that uh, legislating by uh, by fiat is not a great way to proceed. Right. And I so, and for the Congressional Review Act, I mean, those are those measures are they taken as resolutions? Correct. Yeah. They yeah. they would require they would require the president's signature as well. So it's it's uh, it's expressing that Congress uh, does disapprove the legislation, but it still works in the traditional bill path where it would require a signature. Um, the problem that we have right now is that uh, if there is a veto, there is not a bulletproof two-thirds majority uh, to to override any of that. 
So we would be looking at a, at a veto of anything that came out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what happens a lot, and I think the Department, the U.S. Department of Labor uh, loses some credibility, but it changes. It, it's uh, one administration, you know, the Trump administration comes in and with a, you know, a, a fairly um, active Secretary of Labor, Scalia, uh, you know, they they prom they uh, promulgate this rule that to, to, to make it better or easier for businesses and maybe make it clearer and focus on the two factors rather than the six factors. And then new administration comes in and seeks to rescind that rule and, you know, issues a new rule. And that's happened in the overtime area as well. And it's, you know, the same Department of Labor, so to speak, but a uh, different administration. And it's almost like whiplash. And how much how much uh, deference should a court give to a, a rule uh, that's um, uh, issued by a by a federal agency, when you know just a year earlier or two years earlier or three years earlier, that that same agency issued a completely different rule. Yeah, and going off that as well, there are other questions which are raised in some of the lawsuits that I was talking about before, where they're questioning the validity of the rules based on the fact that the current Secretary of Labor is actually acting in the capacity; she has not been uh, officially confirmed to the position. Um, so there are questions about whether or not rules will stick based on the fact that she has not been confirmed by the Senate. Great. Thank you both for that response. Um, we have another question that says, you mentioned current risk being brought on by possible claims filed by independent contractors claiming they are misclassified. My question is, do you foresee the IRS or any other entity planning to proactively audit or seek out businesses that are not in compliance? If so, can you elaborate on what that would look like? Uh, I have, do not, I, I know, um, there's been some effort, uh, to, to share information between Department of Labor and the, uh, uh, the, the IRS, and I think perhaps other agencies, uh, I know in Massachusetts, there was that, uh, sort of a, uh, a more of a broad-based examination of the, you know, the gig economy and the, and the, what, what, the state government or uh, uh, viewed as a, um, you know, an assault on, you know, on, on, on employees and, and the problems with mis misclassification, which they see as not just simply, a, a, you know, a not paying overtime issue or, but also as sometimes as a, you know, a tax revenue issue. Uh, because the, if there are more people that are classified as independent contractors, they sometimes see that as resulting in less money being uh, less uh, tax revenue because there are no withholding taxes. Uh, and it's uh, so it's view it as as hurting the the government as well. Uh, also, it's been attacked as creating an uneven playing field uh, where some businesses are operating. What's that? Uh, you know, take the, you know, the, the Thank you. Uber and yeah, uh, like about 20 that... Mandarin chamomile teas. Uh, can, you, can you mute yourself? 20... We've got somebody. OK, I think we got him. Sorry about that, Bob. Yep. So, you know, you have different industries that have been disrupted by the use of you know, the, the independent contractors or different businesses that have been used different models. And, you know, there's some legitimate concern that it's, there, there's an uneven playing field for businesses. And that's one of the lines of attack as well. And I think when there when there has been some interagency uh, cooperation in this, it's usually under that guise that this is not just hurting employees, but it's also hurting uh, tax revenues is also creating a, you know, it's hurting other businesses that are using, that are em engaging workers as, as employees. Um, I, you know, I, it seems like the IRS is playing a, a much smaller role in this uh, than, you know, than the, than the role, than the role that the agencies are playing or the role that private lawsuits are, are, are playing. Um, and this impacts bigger businesses more than smaller businesses, but there's been a lot of uh, wage hour class action uh, uh, brought complaints brought against hundreds of businesses 
claiming uh, independent contractor misclassification. Uh, uh, and a lot of those have been larger businesses like Uber, like Lyft, like Federal Express that uses uh, uh, independent contractor, uh, owner operator drivers, you know, delivery, you know, delivery companies for sure. Um, so there's been a lot of activity there, uh, and as a lot of is driven by just the threat of class action, it doesn't apply to small business businesses as much. I think for small businesses, it's more the uh, uh, the, the, the state laws and individual claims brought by someone. Well, I'll give you an example. I have a, a small client uh, that hired a, a chief marketing officer independent contractor chief marketing officer, someone that presented him, uh, himself as uh, providing that service, paid uh, that per person handsomely $350 an hour. Uh, and uh, after two years, the relationship you know, ended and uh, the person was paid every dollar that he uh, had invoiced, uh, but paid on a you know 30 day invoice uh, basis. And, um, but then claimed after the relationship had ended, that that he had been misclassified under a state law, in this case Massachusetts, and that should have been treated as an employee. Uh, what are the damages since he was paid everything that he was owed? Well, he said, well, you, you, the employer didn't pay its share, pay its share of FICA. Uh, I should have been eligible for the group health plans and for and for four way four hundred one k contributions. Um, and uh, all of these constitute wages under Massachusetts law, and I'm entitled to not, not just that, that money, but three times that money plus attorney's fees. That's been a lot of the, the, the real sizable risk that I've seen a lot of small employers face is those sorts of individual situations where, uh, you know, someone was treated, was, was paid very well uh, and has turned around and claimed that it was misclassification, you know, after the fact. Um, I've seen it sometimes in the unemployment context where a, a you know company has used a lot of independent contractors and a, a state unemployment agency has turned around and said, we think you misclassified those people and you're responsible for the premiums uh, for the, the, the unemployment uh, compensation and uh, insurance taxes you should have paid if you had classified those people correctly. Um, I don't see it as much in the IRS area. Or in the or in the the state tax area, it's much more in the wage hour uh, area. Okay, thank you for that, Bob. I'm not yeah. seeing. Um, I think there have been a, a couple of really specific questions come in, and and rather than than deal into really specific. Uh, like one-off business questions. I think what we'd like to do is I'll take those and we can try and um, get you responses via email to those questions. So um, Reed and Bob, do you have any following comments? Go to the order. Any any parting comments you'd like to share with folks? I'd just like to uh, extend our sincere appreciation for everybody who joined us today. Um, it, it's great to see so many folks in the small business community want to know more about these issues and want to get engaged as 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 much as they can. Um, we're going to keep the drumbeat up here in D.C. explaining to uh, key policymakers why we have issues with this, why this doesn't work for small businesses. Um, and every time you folks join us, every time you raise your voices, every time you go uh, to, to our site, use our resources to kind of let your legislators know what your opinions are, it really helps us make a stronger and stronger case that we can make some change here. So, uh, again, really, really appreciate everybody coming out today. Uh, and I'll just add, this is, there's... It's somewhat, this is a complicated area because of all the different laws that apply. So it's, I apologize for being more confusing than enlightening perhaps in some of these. I guess the, the my parting comment is, you know, if you are using independent contractors, you know, look at the, you know, get some advice, look at the, look at the situation, make sure you're doing it correctly or if you, uh, and, and you're, you're, you're mitigating your risks. Uh, on a broader issue, I think this is just a big issue for the, you know, for the, for the country uh, that, uh, you know, we just have all these different rules, state and federal. It's confusing for businesses, and it doesn't just really uh, respond to the the changing economy, the the way services are are provided in in the in the country, and we're still applying some, you know, statutes that are nearly a century old in, in you know, ways that just don't make sense. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think there needs to be more effort. And uh, I know 
Yeah. And it's beh- is behind efforts to just to make things simpler and not more complicated for uh, for all businesses, uh, including small businesses that don't necessarily have the resources to to, uh, you know, to, to uh, you know, to respond to these situations. Great. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Um, thank you, Reed, for joining us. And and Bob, as always, your insight is is tremendously helpful. And we greatly appreciate your time and everyone who joined us today. Thank you very much. We will have a recording of this out on our website in the next day or so. Um, so keep an eye out for that. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email um, Ian or myself, um, mday at nsba.biz, and we'll do our best to uh, answer your questions. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye.